Murray McKinney Holub and Jones Foundations of Maternal Newborn and Women's Health Nursing, 7th edition. Chapter 1 Maternity and Women's Health Care Today. Major changes in maternity care occurred in the first half of the 20th century as childbirth moved from home to a hospital setting. Change continues and confusion abounds as healthcare providers and payers attempt to control the increasing cost of care and rapid growth of expensive technology. Despite these challenges, healthcare professionals are focused on patient safety and quality of care. Health problems such as obesity, diabetes, and hypertension may have health consequences not only during childbearing years, but also throughout middle age and beyond. Although improvements in healthcare have resulted in a significant decline in maternal and infant mortality rates in the United States, statistics show a wide disparity between outcomes among races. Historical Perspectives on Childbearing Granny Midwives Before the 20th century, childbirth occurred most often in the home with the assistance of a granny midwife whose training was obtained through an apprenticeship with a more experienced granny or lay midwife. Many women and infants fared well when a midwife assisted with a birth in the home. But maternal and infant death rates from childbearing were high for both hospital and home births. Emergence of medical management. In the late 19th century, developments that were available to physicians, but not always to midwives, led to a decline in home births and an increase in physician-assisted hospital births. By 1960, 90% of all births in the United States occurred in hospitals. Maternity care became highly regimented for most women. Physicians managed all antepartum, before onset of labor, intrapartum, time of labor and birth, and postpartum, first six weeks after childbirth, care. Lay midwifery became illegal in many areas, and nurse midwifery was not well established. The woman's role in childbirth was passive, the physician delivered her infant. The primary functions of nurses were to assist the physician and follow prescribed medical orders after childbirth. Despite technological advances and the move from home to hospital, maternal and infant mortality rates declined slowly. Affluent families could afford comprehensive medical care early in the pregnancy, but poor families had very limited access to prenatal care or information about childbearing. Two concurrent trends, federal government involvement and consumer demands, led to additional changes in maternity care. Government involvement in maternal infant care. High rates of maternal and infant mortality among poor women provided the impetus for federal involvement in maternity care. The Shepherd Towner Act of 1921, the first federally sponsored program, provided funds for state managed programs for mothers and children. Although the Shepherd Towner Act was later repealed. It set the stage for future allocation of federal funds. Today, the federal government supports several programs to improve the health of mothers, infants, and young children. Table 1.1. Although government funds partially solved the problem of maternal and infant mortality, the distribution of health care remains inequitable. Effects of consumer demands on health care. In the early 1950s, Consumers began to insist on their right to be involved in their own health care. Pregnant women were no longer willing to accept only what was offered. They wanted information about planning and spacing their children. They wanted to know what to expect during pregnancy. Fathers, siblings, and grandparents wanted to be part of the extraordinary time of pregnancy and childbirth. Parents wanted more say in the way their children was born. That's right, was born. Early in the 1950s, Dr. Grantley Dick Reed proposed a method of childbirth that allowed the mother to control her fear and thus control her panic during labor, allowing for birth without pharmacologic intervention. Methods such as Lamaze and Bradley also gained favor. A growing consensus among child psychologists and nurse researchers affirmed that early parent-newborn contact outweighed the risk for infection in most situations. Knowledgeable parents insisted that their infants remain with them. The practice of separating the infant from the family was abandoned when infections did not increase in nurseries and family-centered maternity care became the standard. 
Development of Family-Centered Care Family-Centered Care describes safe, high-quality care that recognizes and adapts to both the physical and psychosocial needs of the family, including the newborn. The goal is to foster family unity while maintaining physical safety. Family-Centered Care greatly increased the responsibilities of nurses. Nurses now assume a major role in teaching, counseling, and supporting families in their decisions about childbirth. The basic principles of family-centered care are as follows. Childbirth is usually a normal, healthy event in the life of a family. Childbirth affects the entire family, and family relationships will need to be restructured. Families can make decisions about care if they are given adequate information and professional support. Maintaining a focus on family or other support can benefit a woman as she seeks to maintain health. Choices in Childbirth Most families now recognize that they have choices in the childbirth experience. These choices include the type of provider, birth setting, and support persons for labor and birth. Some insurance providers may limit the choices available to the woman and her family. The woman should be encouraged to verify insurance coverage of provider and birth setting. Healthcare provider Women contemplating pregnancy and birth may choose a certified nurse midwife, CNM, nurse practitioner, NP, or physician to be their health care provider. They need to know what to expect from each of these practitioners. A CNM cares for women at low risk for complications and refers them to a backup physician if problems develop. A CNM provides well woman as well as obstetric care. CNMs, NPs, and physicians treat women during pregnancy and the postpartum period, but NPs do not perform deliveries. NPs usually work in a physician's office and see women for routine prenatal care, but the delivery is performed by the physician. A CNM, NP, or family practice physician also may care for the newborn. Some couples visit several different care providers before choosing the one they think is best for them. They may ask about the provider's usual practices and the provider's beliefs about areas that are important to, important to them, such as medication, episiotomies, or aspects of infant care. Birth setting, labor, delivery, and recovery rooms. Today, the most common location for vaginal birth in a hospital is the labor, delivery, and recovery room, LDR. In an LDR room, Normal labor, birth, and recovery from birth take place in one setting, figure 1.1. During labor, the woman's significant others can remain with her. These people may include relatives, friends, and her other children, depending on the policies of the agency and the mother's desires. After she has given birth, the mother typically remains in the LDR room for one to two hours, after which she is transferred to her postpartum room for the remainder of her hospital stay. The healthy infant may remain with the mother throughout her stay in the LDR room, receiving continuing evaluation for adaptation to neonatal life. When the mother is transferred to her postpartum room, postpartum room, the infant may be transferred to the nursery for more extensive assessment or may remain with the mother in a mother-baby postpartum room while being assessed. Labor, Delivery, Recovery, and Postpartum Rooms Some hospitals offer rooms, like LDR rooms, in layout and function, with the exception that the mother is not transferred to a postpartum unit after recovery. She and the infant remain in the Labor, Delivery, Recovery, and Postpartum, LDRP, room until discharge. The father, or the woman's primary support person, is encouraged to stay with the mother and the infant and sleeping facilities for that person may be provided. Birth centers. Freestanding birth centers are designed to provide maternity care to low-risk women outside a hospital setting. Many centers are also provide gynecologic services, such as annual well woman examination, WWE, and contraceptive counseling. The mother usually attends classes at the birth center or elsewhere to prepare for childbirth, breastfeeding, and infant care. Both the mother and the infant continue to receive follow-up care during the first six weeks after birth. This may include help for breastfeeding problems, a postpartum examination at four to six weeks, 
family planning information, and examination of the newborn. Birth is often assisted by the CNM, who has provided care for the woman throughout her pregnancy and will continue to provide primary care for the mother and the infant. Birth centers are less expensive compared with traditional hospitals, which provide advanced technology that may be unnecessary for low-risk women. Moreover, women who want a safe birth in a familiar, home-like setting with personnel they have known throughout their pregnancies often express satisfaction with birth centers. The main disadvantage is that most independent birth centers are not equipped for major obstetric emergencies. If unforeseen difficulties develop during labor, the woman should be transferred by ambulance to a nearby hospital to the care of a backup physician who has agreed to perform this duty. Although procedures have been designed for these situations, a sudden transfer is frightening for the family. Home births. In the United States, only a small number of women give birth at home. Many CNMs have moved their practices to hospitals or birth centers and may be in practice with physicians. Mothers who, have, mothers who once sought home births have found they can have many of the advantages of family-centered care in the safe environment of a hospital or birth center and yet retain the nurse midwife's care and low intervention approach they prefer. Home birth provides the advantage of keeping the family together in its own familiar environment throughout the childbirth experience. When all goes well, birth at home can be a growth enhancing experience for every family member. Bonding with the infant is unimpeded by hospital routines and breastfeeding is highly encouraged and supported. Women who have their babies at home maintain a feeling of control because they actively plan and prepare for each detail of the birth. Giving birth at home also has disadvantages. Women who plan a home birth should be screened carefully to make sure they have a very low risk for complications. If transfer to a nearby hospital becomes necessary, the time required may be an issue. Other problems associated with home birth include the need for the parents to provide a setting and adequate supplies for the birth. Moreover, the mother must take care of herself and the infant without the in immediate help she would have in a hospital or birth center setting. Support person. During labor, the woman needs someone with her to help her through the experience. The support person is most often the father of her baby, but a relative or friend also may take this role. Some women wish to share the birth experience with several relatives and close friends. If the birth setting is traditional, only one or two people may be permitted to be present. In less traditional settings, more support people are usually allowed. Some women hire a doula to provide support during labor. A doula is a trained labor support person who provides physical and emotional support throughout labor and sometimes during the postpartum period. Many doulas meet with the family before birth and offer pregnancy, childbirth, and parenting classes. Siblings. The presence of children at birth is controversial. Some think children become closer to their new siblings when they are present at birth. Others think the sight of the birth process, blood, and their mothers in pain may be too frightening for children. Some debate focuses on the age of the child attending the birth. Children who participate in the birth of a sibling may attend all or part of the labor and birth or may join the parents just after the birth to participate in the immediate celebration. An adult support person is necessary to stay with the child throughout the experience. The support person should have no role other than attending to the child. This role includes gauging the child's response, providing explanations and reassurance, and taking the child out of the room as needed. Education. Perinatal education is important to help couples learn about pregnancy, birth, and parenting. Many classes not only focus on preparation for childbirth, but also include information formerly received during the birth facility stay. There are options for perinatal education. New families make their choices based on the classes available in the area, costs, and types of information they need. Small classes of a few women and their partners are ideal, but may be too expensive or unavailable. See Chapter 7. Current Trends in Perinatal and Women's Health Care. Healthy People 2020. 
Healthy People 2020, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, is a set of 10-year objectives for improving the health of the people in the United States. It has four overarching goals as follows. Attain high-quality, longer lives, free of preventable disease, disability, injury, and premature death. Achieve health equity, eliminate disparities, and improve the health of all groups. Create social and physical environments that promote good health for all. Promote quality of life, healthy development, and healthy behaviors across all life stages. Many of the specific objectives directly or indirectly pertain to maternity and women's health. Safety and quality. The Joint Commission. The Joint Commission, TJC, is an independent organization that accredits healthcare organizations. They define a set of perinatal core measures for best practice in perinatal care. Accredited organizations report their compliance with these measures each year. The five core measures for perinatal care are decrease the rate of elective deliveries, decrease the rate of cesarean births, increase the rate of antenatal administration of steroids in preterm labor, decrease the rate of newborns with septicemia or bacteremia, and increase the rate of exclusive breastfeeding. Interprofessional collaboration and, and, and education. Interprofessional collaborative practices have been identified as a key to safe, high quality, accessible, patient-centered care. To promote interprofessional team-based patient care and improve patient outcomes, the Interprofessional Education Collaborative, IPEC, has encouraged health professional schools to incorporate interprofessional learning experience into the curricula and define core competencies for interprofessional collaborative practice. It wants to study of pre-licensure health profession students in a high fidelity simulation. Rossler and Kimball, 2016, found that interprofessional interactions during the simulation enhanced interprofessional communication, increased their appreciation for other disciplines, and delineated their disciplines' contribution to the whole when providing care in practice. Alliance for Innovation on Maternal Health. The Alliance for Innovation on Maternal Health, AIM, is a quality improvement alliance of professional organizations, patient representatives, and a health industry informational forum. AIM has developed patient safety bundles for maternal care that represent best practice and are supported by multidisciplinary professional organizations. Patient Safety Bundles. A bundle is a set of evidence-based practice performed together to improve patient outcomes. Maternal safety bundles have been developed for maternal mental health, depression and anxiety, obstetric hemorrhage, severe hypertension in pregnancy, venous thromboembolism, safe reduction of primary cesarean births, reduction of peripartum, racial or ethnic disparities, and support after a severe maternal event. Women's Health and Perinatal Nursing Care Quality Measures Because the actions of nurses have a significant impact on patient outcomes, the Association of Women's Health Obstetric and Neonatal Nurses, or AHON, is in the process of developing nursing care quality measures to guide efforts to measure the quality of nursing care. These measures are currently being tested for feasibility, validity, and reliability, but currently include triage of a pregnant woman and her fetus or multiples, second stage of labor, mother-initiated spontaneous pushing, skin-to-skin -skin initiated immediately after birth, duration of uninterrupted skin-to-skin -skin contact, eliminating supplementation of breastfed healthy term newborns, protection of maternal milk volume for premature infants admitted to the NICU, Initial contact with, with mothers after a neonatal transport, perinatal grief support, women's health and wellness coordination throughout the lifespan, labor support slash partial labor support, and freedom of movement during labor. Cost containment. Government insurance companies, healthcare facilities, and healthcare providers have made a concerted effort to control the increased cost of healthcare in the United States. The Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act was passed in 2010 with the intent to expand access to health insurance, increase consumer protection, emphasize prevention and wellness, improve quality and system performance, expand the health workforce, 
and curb rising health care costs. Updates can be found at www.healthcare.gov. Effects of cost containment on maternity care. Cost containment efforts have had major effects on maternity care, primarily regarding length of stay, LOS. Mothers who have a normal vaginal birth are typically discharged with their newborns from the hospital at 48 hours, and mothers who give birth by cesarean section leave at 96 hours. This is a short time to accomplish the teaching needed before discharge, particularly when the new mother is tired and uncomfortable from the birth. She may or may not have had prenatal classes to prepare her for the care she and her infant will need, and she may not have had prenatal care at all. Support of family or friends after discharge may not exist for all new mothers. Reduced LOS has also affected caregivers, particularly nurses. Nurses are concerned about meeting the needs of families who leave the hospital a short time after the birth of an infant. It is especially difficult to provide adequate information about self-care and infant care when the mother is still recovering from childbirth. Community-based perinatal and women's health nursing. Community-based care has increased in perinatal and women's health nursing because an acute care setting is the most expensive for delivery of health care services. Advances in portable technology and wireless transmission allow nurses in many practice areas to perform procedures in the home that were once limited to the hospital. Documentation and data retrieval are available by secure wireless internet connections. Additionally, women and their families are taught to manage less severe problems at home under the supervision of a nurse, entering the hospital only for possible worsening of the problem. Consumers often prefer home care because of the decreased stress on the family when a woman or newborn does not need to be separated from the family support system for hospitalization. The healthcare system of the future will likely be community oriented and involve care for greater number of patients in the home and through community agencies. Public health agencies have existed for many years and many women obtain all antepartum, postpartum, and neonatal care in these clinics. Other community facilities, such as neighborhood health centers, shelters for women and children, school-age mothers programs, and nurse-managed postpartum centers also provide care to a variety of patients. Nurses need a broad array of skills to function effectively in community-based care. Whether, they care, whether that care takes place in individuals' homes or in large clinics. They should understand the communities in which they practice and the diversity within those communities. Nurses need skills to work with a multidisciplinary team. They are often responsible for assisting patients through high technology choices and therefore need to be proficient in communicating and teaching skills. Perinatal nursing services delivered in a community setting encompasses antepartum, postpartum, and neonatal care. Because care may be given in an environment physically separate from acute care settings, nurses should be able to function independently and have superior clinical and critical thinking skills. They should be proficient in interviewing, counseling, and teaching. They assume a leadership role in the coordination of the services a family may require in a complex case. And they frequently supervise the work of other care providers. Common types of perinatal home care. Antepartum home care. Most preconceptional and low risk antepartum care takes place in private offices or public clinics. High-risk conditions that may be seen in the home by a nurse include preterm labor, hyperemesis gravidum, intractable vomiting during pregnancy, bleeding problems, preterm premature rupture of membranes, hypertension, and diabetes during pregnancy. Severity of these problems and gestational age affect how each will be managed. Postpartum and neonatal home care. Providing the necessary education to new mothers about their self-care, basic care of their infants, and signs of problems they should report after discharge is a challenge for healthcare professionals. Before the woman is discharged, hospitals may offer classes, closed-circuit television programs, written materials, often in multiple languages, 
individual teaching and demonstration, and videos with many relevant topics that a family can take home for later reference. After the woman is discharged, various services may be offered for home care. These services may include telephone calls, home visits, information lines, and lactation consultations, breastfeeding assistance. In addition, nurse-managed outpatient clinics provide care for mothers and infants in some areas. Home care for high-risk neonates. Neonatal home care nurses may provide care to infants who are discharged from the acute care facility with serious medical conditions. Parents of preterm or low birth weight infants require a great deal of information and support. Infants with congenital anomalies such as cleft palate may require care adapted to their conditions. Increasing numbers of technology dependent infants such as those who require ventilator assistance, total paraenteral nutrition, intravenous medications, and apnea monitoring are now cared for at home. Coordination of care for, for the high-risk newborn is a major challenge for home care nurses. Involvement of multiple specialty providers, such as physicians, nurses, respiratory therapists, and equipment vendors may result in duplication or fragmentation of services. Duplication of services results in unnecessary costs and fragmentation of services can result in dangerous gaps in care. Advances in technology. As with other areas of healthcare, perinatal care should keep pace with technologic advances. Healthcare professionals and patients have online access to information from a variety of databases that are often updated, and many of these include data used in this text. Verification of the source of information and appropriate interpretation of that information is essential. Telemedicine is used for consultation between professionals and may provide access to care for people in underserved areas. It is anticipated that the use of telemedicine will continue to evolve. Fetal monitoring data may be stored on electronic media rather than on paper. Video and digital imaging methods are used to preserve and recall crisp images and allow image overlay and computerized comparison, often at distant locations. Personal computer systems are linked to share information about staffing, scheduling, communication, and employee benefits. Electronic medical records are standard in most healthcare facilities. Electronic notebooks can be used to support nurses with drug information, send and receive wireless email, maintain contacts, and download journal articles from publications such as the Journal of Obstetric, Gynecologic, and Neonatal Nursing and Nursing for Women's Health. Maintaining security is essential to ensure appropriate privacy for personal and professional information. Complementary and alternative medicine, CAM, is common. CAM refers to healthcare approaches that differ from conventional Western medicine. When these practices are integrated with conventional treatments, they are complementary. When used in place of mainstream practices, they are alternative. Integrated medicine refers to the coordinated use of conventional and complementary approaches to healthcare. Table 1.2 gives examples of therapies for complementary or alternative care. A press release from NCAM described a survey conducted with the AARP and two-thirds of the people older than 50 years use some form of CAM, but fewer than one-third have ever discussed it with their health care provider. The following are the most common reasons stated by those surveyed. The physician never asked. They did not know they should discuss CAM. There was not enough time during an office visit. Safety is a major concern with the use of CAM. Many people who use these techniques or substances are self-referred. So I'm just going to go ahead and go through this table. Um, cause not much context without reading it. Okay, so... Category and examples. Category, mind-body interventions, behavioral, psychological, social, and spiritual approaches to health. Examples, yoga, relaxation response techniques, 
meditation, tai chi, hypnotherapy, music therapy, spirituality, and biofeedback. Some such as support groups and cognitive behavioral therapy are now mainstream. Manipulative and body-based methods based on manipulation or movement of one of or more parts of the body. Example, chiropractic or osteopathic manipulation or massage. Alternative medical systems, systems developed outside the Western biomedical approach or that evolved apart from the early conventional medical approach in the United States. Examples of systems developed within Western cultures include homeopathy, naturopathic and chiropractic medicine. Non-Western approaches include traditional Chinese medicine, Ayurveda, Native American medicine, and acupuncture. Biologically based therapies use of substances found in nature such as herbs, foods, and vitamins. Examples, dietary supplements, herbal products, and medicinal plants such as ginkgo biloba, ginseng, echinacea, saw palmetto, witch hazel, bilberry, aloe vera, fever, few, and green tea, and aromatherapy. Energy therapies, two types involve the energy fields. Biofield therapies, presumed to affect energy fields that surround the body, such as uh, in examples, it says biofield therapies have not been scientifically proved. Examples include Qigong, Reiki, and therapeutic touch. Uh, also, bioelectromagnetic based therapies, unconventional use of electromagnetic fields. Examples of bioelectromagnetic based therapies include, include pulsed fields, magnetic fields, and alternating current or direct current fields. Hmm. Okay, picking back up in the paragraph. They may delay necessary care from a conventional physician or nurse midwife, or the woman may ingest herbal remedies or other substances that are harmful during pregnancy or lactation. Some CAM therapies are harmful if combined with conventional medications or when taken in excess. Because herbs and vitamins are classified as foods rather than medications, they are not strictly regulated. Therefore, people may consume variable amounts of active ingredients from these substances. Herbal therapies may be used for infertility, premenstrual syndrome, dysmenorrhea, menopausal symptoms, pregnancy, and perennial discomforts, and lactation discomforts. Also, many people may not consider some therapies as alternative because they are considered mainstream in their cultures in which Western medicine is considered alternative. Assessment for the use of CAM therapies is becoming more common for many patient assessment tools in medicine, nursing, pharmacy, and other healthcare specialties. Nurses may find that their professional values do not conflict with many of the CAM therapies. As a profession, nursing supports a self-care and preventative approach to healthcare, in which individuals bear much of the responsibility for their health. Nursing practice has traditionally emphasized a holistic or body-mind-spirit model of health that fits with CAM. Nurses already may widely practice some CAM therapies, such as therapeutic touch. The rising interest in CAM provides opportunities for nurses to participate in research related to the legitimacy of these treatment modalities. Shortage of Nurses Many current nurses are baby boomers, those born in the years 1946 to 1964, and they are nearing retirement age or have already retired. Baby boomers are a large population group, and their need for health care is expected to increase as they age. Many nursing schools increase enrollment with the realization more registered nurses will be needed for care of baby boomers in the future and large numbers of their faculty will likely retire soon. Studies have shown higher RN to patient ratios have reduced hospital mortality, reinforcing the need for an increase in their numbers as boomers retire. In the landmark report, The Future of Nursing, Leading Change, Advancing Health, the Institute of Medicine, IOM, 2011, identified the need for 80% of new RNs to be prepared at the baccalaureate or higher level by 2020. 
Despite this need, nursing schools are turning away qualified applicants to baccalaureate and graduate degree programs because of an insufficient number of faculty, clinical sites, classroom space, clinical preceptors, and budget constraints. Wow, that explains a lot. With inadequate nurse staffing and increasing patient loads as the population ages, nurses face greater work stress and fatigue, leading some to leave acute care or leave the profession. Lengthy shifts of 12 hours in most acute care facilities may be too much for the aging nurse, but these shifts also may be too demanding for the nurse who is a new parent, caregiver of an older adult, or trying to earn a higher degree while working. Wow, this all sounds so true and insightful. Fatigue of long work hours can affect both the nurse's health and the patient's safety. Many healthcare facilities continue not only to support education of new nurses, but also to retain older nurses. Nursing scholarships from a facility may be available to their non-RN employees, usually after completion of the prerequisite courses. Joint appointment of RNs promotes sharing of the nurse's skills and knowledge between a school and a clinical facility. However, the school and clinical facility should clearly limit RN time demands for each facility. Hospitals earning magnet status Recognition from American Nurses Credentialing Center are often more attractive at acquiring and retaining nurses. Measures to maintain safety for both patients and working staff reduce the risk for injury and lost productivity. Greater flexibility in scheduling may be a way for acute care facilities to retain both younger and older nurses. Statistics on Maternal, Infant, and Women's Health Statistics is the science of collecting and interpreting numerical data. In the health and medical sciences, data often focus on mortality rates within a given population. Mortality rates indicate the number of deaths that occur each year by different categories. There are important sources of information about the health of groups of people within a country. They also may be an indication of the value a society places on health care and the kind of health care available to the people. Maternal and infant mortality. Throughout history, mortality rates among women and infants have been high, especially in relation to childbirth. Infant and maternal mortality rates began to fall with the improved health of the general population, application of basic principles of sanitation, and increase in medical knowledge. Improvements in health care, including widely available antibiotics, public health facilities, and increased prenatal care, further reduced infant mortality. Pregnancy-Related Maternal Mortality In 2013, the pregnancy-related mortality rate was 17.3 per 100,000 live births among all women in the United States. This rate has steadily increased, and the reasons for this rise in pregnancy-related deaths is unclear. More pregnant women have chronic health conditions, such as hypertension, diabetes, and chronic heart disease. These conditions place women at increased risk for pregnancy-related complications. Causes of pregnancy-related death include infection or sepsis, hemorrhage, and cardiovascular disease, CVD, including cardio cardiomyopathy. In addition, racial disparities exist. The pregnancy-related mortality for black women is 41.1 deaths per 100,000, compared with white women who experience 11.8 deaths per 100,000. Infant mortality. The infant mortality rate, death before the age of one year, has decreased to 5.96 per 1,000 in 2013. The neonatal mortality rate, death before 28 days of life, is 4.04 deaths per 1,000 live births in 2013. The leading causes of infant mortality are congenital malformations, premature birth, and maternal complications of pregnancy. As in pregnancy-related mortality, racial disparities exist. Non-Hispanic black infants have the highest mortality rates at 11.11 .11 per 100,000 live births. Rates are also higher for American Indian or Alaska Native infants and infants of Puerto Rican descent. The following Healthy People 2020 objectives relate to perinatal 
through infant mortality in the United States. Reduced perinatal mortality, 28 weeks to 7 days after birth, to 5.9 per 1,000 live births and fetal deaths. Reduced infant mortality from the 1998 rate of 7.2 per 1,000 live births to 4.5 per 1,000 live births. Reduced neonatal mortality from the 1998 rate of 4.8 per 1,000 live births to 2.9 per 1,000 live births. Reduced the percentage of low birth weight infants from 7.6 to 5. Reduced the percentage of very low birth weight infants from 1.4 to 0 0.9. Infant mortality across nations. The United States has one of the highest gross national products in the world and is expected to have one of the lowest infant mortality rates. Yet the infant mortality rate in the United States ranked 26th among developed nations. Preterm births in the United States increased for the first time in eight years. In 2015, the preterm birth rate was 9.6%. Late preterm births, 34 to 36 completed weeks of gestation, that is, babies born one to three weeks short of term, have increased in recent years. Preterm birth is the greatest contributor to infant death. Adolescent pregnancy. Teen birth rates have decreased in the United States, and the 2014 teen birth rate fell to 24.2 per 1,000 women in this age group. This may be attributed to use of birth control rather than reduction in sexual activity. The teen pregnancy rate in the United States is substantially higher than in other industrialized countries. Women's health. CBD is the leading cause of death in the United States, and 51% of the deaths occur in women. The epidemic of obesity contributes to the growing problems of hypertension, high blood cholesterol, and diabetes mellitus. Standards of Practice for Perinatal and Women's Health Nursing Both community-based and acute care services should meet guidelines for practice established by the agency itself, appropriate specialty practice organizations, and accrediting agencies. Agency Standards Healthcare agencies are required to have policies, procedures, and protocols to define and guide all elements of care. These standards which should comply with established national standards, should be kept current and accessible to the nursing personnel. Manuals for these agency standards are often available online within the agency for easier access. Updates and periodic reviews are required to maintain validity of care guidelines. Organizational standards. Organizational standards provide broader guidelines that are nationally recognized. AHWAN is recognized as the National Professional Organization for Perinatal and Women's Health Nursing Services, Published standards, education guides, monographs, professional issues, and nursing practice guidelines. Standards set by other professional organizations, such as the American Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, ACOG, the American Academy of Pediatrics, AAP, and the National Association of Home Care and Hospice, may influence standards for perinatal and women's health nurses. Legal standards. Nurses who practice in any healthcare delivery system should understand the definition of nursing practice and the rules and regulations that govern this practice in their work settings. Nurses also should be aware of the scope of practice in varying locations as defined by state nurse practice acts. Other regulatory bodies such as the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, FDA, and the CDC also provide guidelines for practice in those areas. Crediting agencies such as the Joint Commission and the Community Health Accreditation Program, CHAP, give their approval after visiting facilities and observing whether standards are being met in practice. Approval from these accrediting agencies affect reimbursement, and funding decisions as well. The nurse's role. Nurses work in a variety of highly specialized areas, fetal diagnostic centers, infertility clinics, genetic counseling centers, and in acute care settings. Home-based care is an option for some perinatal conditions. Nurses have the primary responsibility to teach, counsel, and intervene for a wide variety of problems affecting the childbearing family. Nurses should develop interpersonal skills to communicate, teach, and collaborate with patients, family, and other members of the healthcare team. Nurses are expected to base their practice on valid and current research and use critical thinking and the nursing process to identify and intervene for a variety of problems. 
The roles of the nurse include communicator, teacher, advocate, collaborator, researcher, and manager. Moreover, many nurses complete advanced programs of education and obtain licensure as an as advanced practice nurse, allowing them to provide primary care to girls and women before, during, and after their childbearing years. Communicator. Nurses use therapeutic communication. Unlike social communication, therapeutic communication is purposeful, goal-directed, and focused. Although it may seem simple, therapeutic communication requires conscious effort and considerable practice. Therapeutic communication techniques. Therapeutic communication involves responding and listening, and nurses should learn to use responses that facilitate rather than block communication. These facilitative responses, often called communication techniques, focus on both the content of the message and the feeling accompanying the message. Communication techniques include clarifying, reflecting, mediating or attentive consideration, maintaining silence, questioning, and directing. In addition, nurses should be aware of blocks to communication. Teacher. Wellness and health improvement opportunities are common in maternity care, and thus teaching represents a major responsibility for nurses who work in these areas. Nurses teach in several settings, including one-on-one -on -one interactions, formal classes, and group discussions. To teach effectively, nurses should be familiar with the basic principles of teaching and learning, which include 1. Readiness of the learner affects the ability to learn. 2. Active participation increases learning. 3. Repetition of a skill increases retention and feelings of competence. 4. Praise and positive feedback are powerful motivators. 5. Role modeling is an effective methodology. 6. Conflicts and frustration impede learning. 7. Learning is enhanced when teaching is structured to present simple tasks before more complex material. 8. Variety of teaching methods may maintain interest and illustrate concepts. And 9. Retention is greater when material is presented in small segments over time. Many factors, including the family's developmental level, primary language, cultural orientation, and previous experiences influence learning. In addition, the nurse should be aware that the physical environment and the organization and skill of the instructor will also affect learning. Collaborator. Nurses collaborate with other members of the healthcare team, often coordinating and managing a woman's or infant's care. Care is improved by an interdisciplinary approach as nurses work together with dietitians, social workers, physicians, and others. Managing the transition from an acute care setting to the home involves discharge planning and collaboration with other healthcare professionals. The nurse should be knowledgeable about community and financial resources to promote a smooth transition. Cooperation and communication are essential to best encourage women to participate in their care and meet the needs of newborns. Researcher. Nurses use research when they follow clinical practice guidelines and professional standards. They participate in research when they are involved in structured quality improvement initiatives and when they search for a solution for a unique patient problem. Nursing care should be based on valid research on valid research findings rather than tradition. Evidence-based practice is expected. Advocate. An advocate speaks on behalf of another person. As the healthcare environment becomes increasingly complex, care may be impersonal. The nurse is, an ideal, is in an ideal position to humanize care and intercede on behalf of the patient and family. The nurse provides information to women and their families to ensure they are involved in decisions and activities related to their care. The nurse then incorporates those decisions into the planning and implementation of care. This may include communicating the family's decisions to other members of the healthcare team. On a community level, nurses should be advocates for health promotion of vulnerable groups, such as victims of domestic violence or women unable to pay for low-cost preventative care, such as yearly well woman exams. Manager. The role of nurses includes that of manager. Nurses may delegate tasks such as ambulation or taking vital signs to unlicensed personnel. Thus, nurses spend more time teaching women and families and supervising unlicensed personnel. Nursing care managers often provide coordination of care for many patients. Nurses are expected to understand the financial aspects of patient care. At the same time, they should continue to act as patient advocates and maintain standards of care. Advanced Preparation for Maternal, Newborn, and Women's Health Nurses 
Greater complexity of care and the need to contain costs have increased the need for nurses with various types of advanced preparation. Advanced practice nurses may practice as CNMs, nurse practitioners, clinical nurse specialists, nurse educators, and nurse researchers. Preparation for advanced practice involves obtaining a master's or doctoral degree. Prescriptive authority is often part of the advanced practice certification, but its extent may vary in different states. Nurses working in mid-level or higher management are often required to have an advanced degree in healthcare administration or the specialty that they lead. Certified Nurse Midwives CNMs are RNs who have completed an extensive program of study and clinical experience. They have completed a graduate level, Master of Science, or Doctor of Nursing, Practice, DNP, program and have passed the certification test administered by the American College of Nurse Midwives. CNMs are qualified to take complete health histories and perform physical examinations. They can provide complete care during pregnancy, childbirth, and the postpartum period. CNMs are committed to providing information to prevent problems during pregnancy and facilitate normal pregnancy and childbirth. The CNMs provide annual well woman exams, gynecology services, family planning information, and counseling. The practice approach of the CNM to childbirth is non-interventionist and supportive to low-risk patients. Pregnancy and birth are regarded as normal processes. Nurse Practitioners Nurse practitioners are RNs with advanced preparation at the master or doctoral level and certification who provide primary care for the specific group of patients, specific groups of patients. They obtain a complete health history, perform physical examinations, order and interpret laboratory and other diagnostic studies, and provide primary care for health maintenance and health promotion. Nurse practitioners may collaborate with physicians regarding administering treatments and medications, but depending on their scope of practice and the Board of Nursing mandates for practice in their state, they may work independently and prescribe medications. The Woman's Health Nurse Practitioner, WHNP, provides wellness-focused, primary, reproductive, and gynecologic care over a woman's lifespan, beginning from adolescence. Family Nurse Practitioners, FNPs, are prepared to provide preventative, holistic care for young as well as older family members. They may care for women during uncomplicated pregnancies and provide follow-up care to mothers and infants after childbirth. Unlike CNMs, nurse practitioners do not perform deliveries for the woman during childbirth. Neonatal nurse practitioners, NNPs, assist in the care of high-risk newborns in the intermediate post-birth care or in a NICU. Pediatric nurse practitioners, PNPs, provide health maintenance care to infants and children who do not require the service of physicians. They may see infants at well baby visits and to provide treatment for common illnesses. Clinical nurse specialists. Perinatal clinical specialists are RNs who, through study and supervised practice at the graduate level, master's or doctorate, have acquired expertise in the care of childbearing women with complex problems. Core competencies for the CNS include direct care, consultation, systems leadership, collaboration, coaching, research, and ethical decision making. Unlike nurse practitioners and midwives, CNSs do not provide primary care. Nursing research. As maternal newborn nursing and the healthcare system change, nurses are challenged to demonstrate that their work improves patient outcomes and is cost effective. To meet this challenge, nurses should generate, participate in, and use research. With the establishment of the National Institute of Nursing Research, NINR, in the National Institutes of Health, NIH, nurses now have an infrastructure to ensure the support of nursing research and the education of well-prepared nurse researchers. The NINR seeks to establish a scientific basis for nursing care of patients throughout life. The translation of scientific advances into cost-effective quality care is inherent to the mission of the NINR. Evidence-based practice. Clinically-based nursing research is increasing rapidly as nurse re researchers strive to develop an independent body of knowledge that demonstrates the value of nursing interventions. This is achieved through evidence-based practice. Evidence-based practice is 
a problem-solving approach to the delivery of healthcare that integrates the best evidence from studies and patient care data with clinician expertise and patient preferences and values. This approach promotes high quality care and best patient outcomes. Ahwan has an ongoing commitment to develop and disseminate evidence-based practice guidelines through the association's research-based practice program. Implementation of evidence-based guidelines promotes application of the best available scientific evidence for nursing care rather than care based on tradition alone. Nurses contribute to their profession's knowledge base by systematically investigating theoretic or practice-related issues in nursing. Nursing generates and answers its own questions based on research of its unique subject matter. The responsibility for research within nursing is not limited to nurses with graduate degrees. It is important that all nurses apply valid research findings to their practices. Evidence based practice is not just an ideal, but also is an expectation of nursing practice. Nurses can contribute to the body of professional knowledge by demonstrating an awareness of the value of nursing research and assisting in problem identification and data collection to identify best practices. Nurses should keep their knowledge current by networking and sharing research findings at conferences, by publishing, and by reading research in professional journals. A minimal number of continuing education hours is needed for license renewal in each U.S. state and territory. Students and inexperienced nurses may participate in nursing research planned by experts and use updated knowledge from research as they enter nursing practice. Referred professional nursing journals such as Journal of Obstetric Gynecologic and Neonatal Nursing, Nursing for Women's Health, Nursing Research, the Journal of Perinatal and Neonatal Nursing, and the Journal of Neonatal Nursing are sources of verified information about maternal, newborn, and women's health nursing that help validate nursing actions and remove measures that have not proved valid. The Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, AHRQ, a branch of the U.S. Public Health Service, actively sponsors research in health issues facing mothers and children. From research generated through this agency, as well as others, high quality evidence can be accumulated to guide the best and lowest cost clinical practices. Clinical practice guidelines are an important tool in developing parameters for safe, effective, and evidence-based care to mothers, infants, children, and families. The AHRQ has developed several guidelines related to adult and child care, as have other organizations and professional groups concerned with healthcare. Quality and safety improvements, enhanced primary care, access to high quality care, and specific illnesses are addressed in available practice guidelines. Guidelines are available at www.guidelines.gov. The Institute of Medicine, IOM, has published standards for developing practice guidelines to maximize the consistency within the and among guidelines, regardless of guideline developers. The IOM recommends inclusion of information and process steps in every guideline. This includes ensuring diversity of members of the clinical guideline group, full disclosure of conflict of interest, in-depth systematic reviews of, uh, to inform recommendations, provision of a rationale, quality of evidence, and strength of recommendation for each recommendation made by the guideline committee, and external review of recommendations for validity. Standardization of clinical practice guidelines will strengthen evidence-based care especially for guidelines developed by nurses or professional nursing organizations. Another resource for evidence-based practice in perinatal nursing is the Cochrane Collaboration, www.cochrane.org, which provides coordination of research results by an international network of individuals and institutions. The results in the Cochrane database do not prescribe policies, procedures, or protocols that a facility should follow. However, the evaluations of research identify and distill results from available research, so best practices may be incorporated into facility practices. That's some exciting stuff right there. Critical thinking. In recent years, critical thinking has received widespread attention in nursing. Clearly, nurses should be concerned with developing critical thinking skills, needing not only to pass the NCLEX, 
but a also to function clinically. Nurses should be concerned with learning and refining the critical thinking skills needed to function in the rapidly changing clinical arena. Critical thinking is controlled and purposeful rather than undirected. It is outcome focused toward finding solutions to problems. For effective critical thinking, nurses should gain insight into their own thought processes and analyze their own thinking by taking it apart for examination and criticism. Critical thinking includes recognizing and acknowledging specific habits and responses that may interfere with productive thinking. Critical thinking is based on reason rather than preference or prejudice. It also seeks to examine feelings to understand how emotions affect thinking. Finally, critical thinking requires the suspension of judgment opinion till evidence is adequate to support inferences or for drawing conclusions. Purpose. The purpose of critical thinking is to help nurses make the best clinical judgments. The process begins when nurses realize that accumulating knowledge from texts and lectures is not enough. They also should be able to apply this knowledge to specific clinical situations and thus reach conclusions that provide the most effective care in each situation. In addition, nurses should honestly examine their own thought processes for flaws that could lead to inaccurate conclusions or poor judgments. Although this examination requires self-analysis, a series of steps makes this process easier. Critical thinking exercises are presented throughout the book to help students develop skills in critical thinking and application of knowledge in possible real life situations. Steps, a series of steps may help clarify the way critical thinking is learned. These steps may be called the A, B, C, D, E's of critical thinking. They include recognition of assumptions, examination of personal biases, analysis of the amount of pressure for closure, examination of how data are collected and analyzed, and evaluation of how emotions may interfere with critical thinking. Recognizing assumptions. Assumptions are ideas, beliefs, or values that are taken for granted without basis in fact or reason. Such assumptions may lead to unexamined thoughts or unsound actions. For instance, following assumptions may have negative consequences. Anyone who wants a job can get one. Teenagers don't listen. Every woman wants a baby. A list of everything known about a specific situation may help in the identification of assumptions. Each item on the list should be analyzed to determine whether it's true, whether, it's, whether it could be true, and whether it is untrue or evidence is insufficient to determine its truth. Examining biases. Biases are prejudices that sway the mind toward a particular conclusion, of course, of action on the, on the basis of personal theories or stereotypes. Biases are based on unexamined beliefs, and many are widespread. For instance, fat people are lazy, women are bad drivers, men are insensitive. People may be biased against those of different races, religions, or lifestyles. When faced with a predisposition to judge a person or group of persons, it may be wise to ask oneself or a coworker a series of questions. Why do you think that? What if this was a different person? What if there were different circumstances? What might someone who disagrees say? What is influencing my thinking? Determining the need for closure. Many people look for immediate answers and experience a great deal of anxiety till a solution is found for any problem. In other words, they have little tolerance for doubt or uncertainty, which is sometimes called ambiguity. As a result, they feel pressure to come to a decision or reach closer as early as possible. This is one of the most important aspects of critical thinking because those who feel pressure to reach an early decision or find a quick solution often do so with insufficient data. To overcome pressure to reach an early conclusion, a conscious effort should be made to suspend, delay, or bring to a stop judgment. This is called reflective skepticism or doubt in the absence of conclusive evidence. The first step is to acknowledge the anxiety created by postponed decisions. The next step involves deliberately waiting to make a decision. The timeout before a surgical procedure 
is an example of deliberately waiting. All staff members verify patient's name, procedure, operative site, and implants, if applicable. Some people who jump to conclusions often stop with one answer. To overcome this tendency, they should always look for a second right answer. They could also imagine the problem from the perspective of someone else. They might ask a series of questions. What alternatives do we have? What else might work? What information supports this? What effect would that have? Is there good evidence to support that decision? Is there reason to doubt that evidence? On the other hand, some people can tolerate a great deal of doubt and uncertainty. They are comfortable with data collection and analysis, but feel uncomfortable making decisions. They may procrastinate or postpone the decision for as long as possible. Failure to make a decision in the clinical area may have serious consequences for patients and their families. Several questions may help overcome the tendency to, sp to postpone reaching a decision. What signs indicate something is wrong? Do I need to do something about it? How much time do I have? What happens if I don't do something about this? What should I do first? What resources can help me? This step also might be called priority setting and is one of the most important aspects of critical thinking in nursing. Becoming skillful in data management. Expertise in collecting, organizing, and analyzing data involves developing an attitude of inquiry and learning to live with questions such as why, what if, what else? Is this relevant? How does it relate to that? How can I organize the data? Does the data form patterns? And what can I infer from those patterns? Collecting data. To obtain complete data, nurses should develop skill in verbal communication. Open-ended questions elicit more information than questions that require only a one-word answer. Follow-up questions often are needed to clarify information or pursue a particular thought. Validating data. Nurses should validate unclear or incomplete information to make certain that the information collected is accurate. This process may involve rechecking physical signs, collecting additional information, or determining whether a perception is accurate. Organizing and analyzing data. Data are more useful when organized into patterns or clusters. The first step is to separate relevant data from data that may be interesting but are unrelated to the current situation. The next step is to compare data with expected norms to determine what is within the expected range, normal, and what is not, abnormal. Abnormal results provide cues that can be grouped or clustered so that conclusions can be made. For example, all data that may indicate excessive bleeding, such as pulse rate, blood pressure, amount of vaginal bleeding, and skin color, may seem more meaningful when grouped. Organizing data into clusters often reveals that additional data are needed before a decision can be reached. Acknowledging emotions and environmental factors. Several emotions and environmental factors may influence critical thinking. For instance, the clinical area is often a noisy, fast-paced, and hectic environment with time limitations and distractions that make calm reflection and reasoning difficult. Fatigue also reduces the ability to concentrate during a 12-hour shift. Inexperienced nurses and students may lack confidence in their knowledge and often feel anxious, which may reduce the ability to think critically. Fatigue in older experienced nurses reduces their ability to mentor new graduates or nurses with less experience in the specialty. Many nurses, both experienced and inexperienced, have a strong need to protect their self-image. As a result, they may be unwilling to seek assistance and fail to communicate. Some nurses may become defensive when they have said or done something wrong. This response is a serious barrier to critical thinking, which requires that all healthcare professionals learn to acknowledge mistakes and become comfortable with constructive criticism. Extreme emotions such as anger and frustration impede critical thinking by narrowing the focus to only data that support the intense feeling. For example, persons who are extremely frustrated often may repeat the perceived cause of their frustration and may be unable to move on to other information to address the problem. The first step is to recognize and acknowledge factors or emotions that impede thinking. For example, nurses may find it necessary to say, I feel flustered by all the activity and need to find a quiet spot for a few minutes, concentration. 
To develop critical thinking skills, the nurse should learn to admit mistakes and become comfortable saying, I was wrong. Asking for assistance, verification, or validation is wise when fatigue is a problem or when lack of confidence creates anxiety. A person who experiences intense frustration or anger should recognize these emotions and their influence on rational thought. A trusted colleague may be asked to point out signs of these emotions, such as repetitive, vehement comments. Some people use other methods of control, such as visualizations, breathing exercises, and brief self-imposed timeouts for, uh, from the precipitating situation, if possible. Application of the nursing process. The nursing process forms the basis of maternal, newborn, and women's health nursing, as for all nursing. The nursing process consists of five distinct steps. One, assessment. Two, identification of patient problems or nursing diagnosis. Three, planning. Four, implementation. And five, evaluation. In maternal, newborn, and women's health nursing, the nursing process applies to a population that is often healthy and experiencing a life event that holds a potential for both growth and problems. Nursing activity in these settings is often devoted to the assessment and diagnosis of patient strengths and healthy functioning to achieve a higher or more satisfying level of wellness. This focus often differs from that of providing care for adults or children who are usually ill when the nurse encounters them. The nursing process is written in the text as a linear step-by-step -step process. However, with knowledge and experience, the nurse applies the nursing process in the clinical setting dynamically. For example, the nurse may discover that the woman has a full bladder early in a postpartum assessment. The nurse skips to an intervention and helps the woman to the restroom to urinate before completing the assessment. This action is taken by the nurse to prevent patient discomfort and possible excessive bleeding caused by a full bladder. In another example, the nurse goes to the woman's room to give her an injection of Rogam, discovers the woman nursing her baby, who is eagerly suckling for the first time in several hours. Based on critical thinking, the nurse delays the injection and intervention, which would require the woman to change her position. The nurse realizes that the few minutes required for the infant to complete the feeding are more important than the short delay in giving the injection. Assessment. Nursing assessment should be accomplished systematically and deliberately and include objective and subjective data related to physiologic, psychologic, social, and cultural status of the patient. Although the woman or infant may be the primary patient, nurses should assess the belief systems, available support, perceptions, and plans of other family members to provide the best nursing care. Two levels of nursing assessment are used to collect comprehensive data, screening assessment and focus assessment. Screening assessment. The screening or database assessment is usually performed at the first contact with the person. The purpose is to gather information about all aspects of the person's health. This information, called baseline data, describes their health status before interventions begin. It forms the basis for identification of both strengths and problems. A variety of methods are used to organize the assessment. For example, information may be grouped according to body systems or organized around nursing theory models, such as Roy's adaptation to stress theory, Gordon's functional health patterns, the human response patterns of the North American Nor Nursing Diagnosis Association International, NANDA-I, or Orem's self-care deficit theory. Focus assessment. A focus assessment is used to gather information specifically related to an actual health problem or a problem that the woman or family is at risk for acquiring. A focus assessment is often performed at the beginning of a shift and centers on areas relevant to childbearing, newborn, or women's health nursing. For instance, in care of the mother and infant, after birth, the nurse should assess the breasts and nipples because the mother is at risk for problems if she does not have adequate information about breastfeeding or care of the nipples. 
A focused assessment also may reveal strengths that nursing care will enhance. Identification of patient problems. The data gathered during assessment should be analyzed to identify existing or potential strengths or problems and their causes. Data are validated and grouped in a process of critical thinking to determine cues and inferences. The problems identified may be actual or an increased risk for a problem, or the nurse may identify wellness opportunities. Health needs for which nurses can provide independent nursing interventions and for which they are legally accountable are termed nursing diagnoses. At present, more than 200 nursing diagnoses have been identified by Nanda I. Planning. The third step in the nursing process involves planning care for the problems identified. During this step, nurses set priorities, develop goals or outcomes, and plan interventions to accomplish these goals. Setting priorities. Setting priorities includes, one, determining which problems need immediate attention, life-threatening problems, and taking action. Two, determining whether potential problems call for a physician's order for diagnosis, monitoring, or treatment. And three, discriminating actual problems that take precedence over an increased risk. Establishing goals and expected outcomes. Although the term goals and expected outcomes are sometimes used interchangeably, they are different. Broad goals should be linked with specific and measurable outcome criteria. For example, if the goal is for the parents to demonstrate effective parenting by discharge, then the expected outcomes that serve as evidence might include prompt, consistent responses to infant signals and competence in bathing, feeding, and comforting the infant. The following rules apply to written expected outcomes. Outcomes should be stated in patient-oriented terms, identifying who is expected to achieve the goal. This is usually the woman, the infant, or the family. Measurable verbs should be used. For example, identify, demonstrate, express, walk, relate, and list are observable and measurable verbs. Examples of verbs that are difficult to measure are understand, appreciate, feel, accept, know, and experience. For, ex for instance, Ms. Brown will experience less anxiety about assuming care of her infant. Poses a problem because determining whether she experiences less anxiety is difficult. This outcome can be reworded as Ms. Brown will state that she feels less anxious about assuming care of her infant and will participate in infant care, umbilical cord, circumcision, bathing, before discharge. A time frame is necessary. When is the person expected to perform the action? By the first postpartum day, after teaching, by discharge, within the second trimester? Goals and expected outcomes should be realistic and attainable. For instance, the patient has pain as a result of a lack of knowledge about pain control, a realistic expected outcome might be Sandra will state that her pain during labor is manageable using techniques taught by her nurse. A goal such as will remain pain free throughout labor is not attainable by nursing interventions only and is not realistic. Goals and expected outcomes are collaborated with the patient and family to ensure their participation in the plan of care. Developing nursing interventions. After the goals and expected outcomes are developed, nurses write nursing interventions that will help the patient meet the established outcomes. Interventions for actual patient problems. Nursing interventions for actual patient problems are aimed at reducing or eliminating the causes of related factors. For instance, if the problem is ineffective attachment between the parents and newborn resulting from separation from the infant because of illness, the desired outcome might be the parents will demonstrate progressive attachment behaviors such as touching, palming, eye contact, and participation in infant care within one week. Nursing 
interventions focus on role modeling attachment behaviors and increasing contact between parents and their baby. Interventions for risk for patient problems. Interventions are aimed at one, monitoring for onset of the problem, two, minimizing risk factors, and three, preventing the problem. For example, if baby Sam is at an increased risk for skin breakdown because of frequent loose stools, the planned outcome is the skin remains intact. Nursing interventions include monitoring the condition of the skin at prescribed intervals for signs of skin impairment and initiating measures to keep the skin clean and dry to reduce the risk for skin impairment. Wellness interventions. Interventions also focus on opportunities for health enhancement. Nursing care seeks to promote patient success through the teaching of self-care measures. Examples of wellness interventions include teaching related to weight reduction, exercise for lower chronic hypertension, or reconditioning the body after birth. Implementing interventions. Implementing nursing interventions may be a problem if written interventions are not specific. Nursing interventions should be as specific as physician's orders and may be formulated with computerized care plans. If a physician orders hydrocodone with acetaminophen, 5 milligrams to 500 milligrams, one tablet PO orally every six hours as needed for pain, the order specifies the combination drug to be given, the dose to be given, the route of administration, the time, and the reason. A well-written nursing intervention is equally specific. Teach woman not to break, chew, or crush the drug tablet. Conversely, poorly written interventions such as assist with breastfeeding provide generalizations rather than specific interventions. Specific methods the nurse should use to assist breastfeeding are more effective. For example, demonstrate correct positioning in cradle and football hold at first attempt to breastfeed. Teach mother to elicit rooting reflex by stroking infant's lips with nipple. Demonstrate how to latch infant to nipple and request a return demonstration before mother and baby are discharged. Evaluation. The evaluation determines the effectiveness of the plan and its goals or expected outcomes. The nurse should assess the status of the patient and compare the current status with the goals or outcome criteria developed during the planning step. The nurse then judges the person's progression towards goal achievement and makes a decision. Should the plan be continued, modified, abandoned? Are the problems resolved or the causes diminished? Is a different patient problem more relevant? The nursing process is dynamic and evaluation frequently results in expanded assessment and additional or modified patient problems and interventions. Nurses are cautioned not to view lack of goal achievement as a failure but as a signal to reassess and begin the process anew. Individualized nursing care plans. Nurses are responsible for documenting the patient problem or nursing diagnosis, expected outcomes, and interventions for each problem. This information is often communicated to colleagues through a written plan of care. Many institutions have standards of care for groups of patients, such as those who have had normal spontaneous vaginal births. However, individual nursing care plans may be necessary based on needs or problems identified during the assessment step of the nursing process. When nurses write individualized plans of care, they implement the plans through interventions that direct the care. Box 1.1. Some patient situations end with a single office visit, whereas others progress over time such as normal or complicated birth. Specific planned nursing care may be documented by office, clinic, or hospital computer systems, and the systems may be linked to improve continuity. The nursing process related to critical thinking. Although the nursing process and critical thinking are similar and overlap in many respects, major differences exist. The five steps of the nursing process provide a logical method for problem solving. 
Problem solving begins with a specific problem and ends with a solution. Conversely, critical thinking is open-ended. It goes before and beyond problem solving. Critical thinking may be triggered by a problem, a positive event, or an opportunity to improve. It focuses on appraisal of the way the individual thinks, and it emphasizes reflective skepticism. Critical thinking is used throughout each step of the nursing process, Table 1.4. And that is it for Chapter 1.